Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks, Keith, for inviting me to do this series. Um, first of all, I'd like to mention that Jeremy gave his apologies because he has a previous commitment that was made months ago, uh, which is on tonight at the same time. Uh, but he said he definitely plans to be here um, in the following uh, weeks. When Keith approached me about doing um, a series, uh, I didn't just want to do any old Bible study series. I'm very much into the church having a vision of what Jesus wants for his church. Uh, I mean, there's lots of Bible study subjects that people can um, study, but where are we going to end in our Christian walk? A lot of people think, uh, I want to get saved, go to heaven, and they think that's what it means to be a Christian. Well, I'll put it this way, it's certainly better than the alternative. Uh, <clears throat> but the thing is, God didn't just create you for the sole purpose of getting you to heaven. He created you to uh, fulfill, manifest, display the fullness of his glory, to display all that he is, and for him to find his full satisfaction in you and me. Uh, he wanted, uh, you could say, to have a family. Now, we need a few more chairs, I think. Yeah. There's a couple of empty spots up the front still here so that may be used. <clears throat> so, and especially in the light of everything that is happening in the world today, the number of questions that I have been uh, receiving on uh, WhatsApp, uh, on uh, uh, the uh, emails, uh, on Zoom, uh, mainly relate to what's going on in the world today, what's God's plan, and what's his plan for us? Uh, what's going to be the end of it all? Uh, is Jesus coming back tonight? Is some of the things that people like to ask, and I say, no, I'm sorry, he's not coming back tonight. Um, he, he, may, he may come back for you and me personally, uh, um, but that's not his plan and purpose. His plan and purpose is to manifest his glory all over the world as the waters cover the sea. Uh, the church is not going to finish its journey as a bunch of wimps who were saying, like on, they, on that TV show, get me out of here. No. Uh, he wants to plant within us an understanding of his passion and where he wants to take us and where he wants us to take the rest of the church. So... The subjects that have been chosen for this four-week series uh, are aimed in giving us a much better um, understanding of the events that are happening. Another thing that uh, Annette and I have noticed through YouTube is that there uh, is a whole variety um, of teachings that are contradictory to each other. Uh, and... It's important that we as a church fellowship have a common vision. It doesn't mean to say we agree on everything, but at least we need to have a common vision. What is the purpose um, of the church? I'm not talking about GVCF's purpose. I'm talking about God's purpose for GVCF in the midst of the shepherd and community. What's his purpose? And... For us to be able to walk more effectively according to what's in his heart, then you and I really need to be of the one heart, the same faith, the same vision, the same direction. Details may be different, but at least we need to have the same vision. 
When I became uh, a Christian uh, back in 1965, a few years ago, uh, a common thread was a song that said, Hold the fort, for he is coming. In other words, just keep hanging on and, 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 and just hang on until Jesus comes and snatches you out of, um, out of the way and, phew, I made it. But that's not his plan and purpose. His plan and purpose is for a victorious and glorious church, an overcoming church. Now, when we look around, uh, particularly in the Western world, there have been different teachings that have become rather dominant in certain streams of the church. And because of this, because they, they appear to be dominant, we take them to be, oh, that's what the whole church believes, where in fact these so-called dominant views may actually be the minority. Uh, the majority, uh, they've got another problem, and that is, oh, I've been fighting so long, uh, I'm, I'm not prepared to get into another discussion um, on this subject, and they go quiet. I mean, it happens in social issues too, we know that, that people just go quiet. And so uh, what is called the, uh, the, the minority, the noisy minority, become the dominant. Uh, and that's what influences education and politics and the ec economy uh, and religious beliefs. So uh, in this uh, series... Uh, now, it's all going to be, ha they'll all have PowerPoints. And uh, I don't know, do we have a way to, to put the PowerPoints onto a Dropbox uh, or something like that? And then everybody can just download uh, the, the PowerPoint for themselves. <clears throat> because I will go over the material fairly quickly. Uh, and you say, oh, I, I can't get it all down. Well... That's because I want to get through as much material as I can within the one hour that we uh, have each week. And it would be very helpful for you if after you have done these studies that you take them and go over and read again and look at every one of the scriptures that are mentioned because it's not important what I say. It's not important what I believe. It's what the Bible says. And we all have to go to the Bible as the full and final authority of what is truth. So uh, I can tell you things and I can, I can say, I believe this is absolutely true. Well, it might be, but I'm not perfect. Uh, I do get some things wrong. I remember when Annette and I started uh, going together, I was faced with a dilemma. You see, I got saved in an Anglican church, very similar to the story we heard on, on Sunday, uh, through John 3, being born again. Um, I was in a very evangelical Anglican church. In the afternoons, I, I went to a brethren Bible study because we didn't have Bible studies per se in the Anglican church. Uh, and I was hungry, and I wanted to know the word of God. So I had these friends of mine that were uh, open brethren, not exclusive brethren, very similar to the Baptists other than uh, in the, the leadership style of their fellowships. And uh, I, I just loved studying the word. Well... This was in the era of the early days of the charismatic renewal. And the Anglican uh, vicar, he, he taught us that it's not really relevant for today. He wasn't for it, wasn't against it, but, you know, the church has gone for 2,000 years without it, so we can still plot on. Uh, the Brethren uh, Church, they were much stronger on this issue. Uh, speaking in tongues is of the devil. Oh, so that was a rather strong uh, position, but I had a bit of problem, well, actually, with both 
both viewpoints because I began to see there were things in the Bible uh, that I couldn't pull them out. And, but I couldn't agree with this guy, uh, you know, who was saying speaking in tongues was of the devil. I was hitchhiking one day and I got picked up with a, uh, with a guy and he, he says to me, are you a Christian? And I said, yes. And he says, how do you know? I said, well, I asked Jesus into my, into my life. I says, don't you know what Jesus said? He said, you know, these things will follow them that believe. They will speak with, with new tongues. He said, if you don't speak in new tongues, you're not saved. Oh, my goodness. I've got another view now. Uh, <laughs> uh, this was from Lloyd Longfield's group. And uh, they said, well, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. So uh, I was only a young Christian. I'd only been a Christian maybe... <coughs> nine months but I loved the word of God I was reading the word of God and then I met Annette and this was a problem because she went to a Pentecostal church uh, and uh, she had actually written a letter to me before we'd actually met and offered this music group from their church to come and sing she had heard there was a bit of a revival going on in the school so she offered this music group called the Gospel Firebrands. And, uh, uh, and I didn't even bother to answer. I thought, this is a Pentecostal. I mean, all they'll do is swing from the chandeliers. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, I didn't really think that this was something that was going to be profitable for the preaching of the gospel. Well, I got to meet her. And the day that I met her, and I was sitting in the... Uh, the front row in the, in, the, in the class. She was my school teacher for a day. She walked through the door, which was over there, and the moment I saw her, I didn't know who she was, but I knew that's my wife. And, uh, uh, and, and she taught Australian history. I sat in the front and I stared at her. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and she noticed, but she thought, boy, this, this fellow's really interested in Australian history. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, we, I, I went up, introduced myself, got her phone number, uh, and uh, you know we began uh, talking about things. Well, uh, and I told her that uh, speaking in tongues was of the devil. Well, she says, "Well, why do you say that?" No, and she went uh, through this particular issue, scripture by scripture. And I tried to give arguments for everything that she had uh, said to me. Well, one day, some of my brethren friends came around who believed that this was, speaking in tongues was of the devil, and Annette happened to be there. And these guys were throwing those things out. And I started answering them with all the things that Annette had been giving me. And after they went, she said, when did you change your view? <laughs> I was caught. Um, but I learned from uh, those early days that what counts is the scriptures. Not people's ideas, not eloquent arguments, but what do the scriptures say? And some of the issues that we will talk about in these four weeks are some of the sort of Issues that you could say are controversial um, in the Christian world. So many different views. But I really want to see GVCF as a church fellowship that is firmly founded on the Word of God. Uh, if I show you something, tell you something that cannot be justified from the Scriptures, uh, there's a rubbish bin over here. Fortunately, it's only a little one. Uh, <laughs> But uh, the thing is, uh, I don't want you to accept anything that you cannot see uh, in the scriptures. And that's one reason I'd like you to get a copy of the PowerPoints so you can go over it, investigate it. And if you find things that you disagree with, tell me. You can do it by email, you can do it face to face, why you disagree with this particular thing. Don't, don't tell me, I heard my preacher say I heard my pastor say, I heard such and such a charismatic, well-known uh, Bible teacher say. That doesn't mean a thing to me. What means anything to me, what does the Bible say? So anyway, tonight the subject is perfection of the church and the great end time harvest. 
Now, this is a controversial subject because you will find many, many churches, many, many Bible teachers will say perfection is impossible, even though it's been commanded in the Scriptures. Uh, it's impossible. And some people have said to me, well, when we get to heaven, we will be perfected. And I say, well, what's the problem? Is God not able to do it here? Doesn't he have the power to do it here? Do we have to wait till we get to heaven for him to do it? Uh, but this is what a lot of people believe. You cannot get perfect on earth. After all, we're human. Well, don't you think we're still going to be human in heaven? Yeah, redeemed humanity. Changed, transformed and perfected by the processes that God has put in his word. As far as the timing is concerned... God's roadmap, this is from Genesis to Revelation, from eternity to eternity, from the fall of Satan through to the casting out of, uh, of Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet and all of the ungodly into the lake of fire. Everything else is covered in these two weeks. Two weeks of time uh, and in Hebrews 4 and Hebrews, uh, or verse 4 and verse 9, we see that there are two seventh days. In Hebrews 4.4 4, it says, On the seventh day God rested from all his works. And that was talking about the creation. God worked for six days in the creation. The seventh day he rested. Hebrews 4 and verse 9, he tells it there's another seventh day coming. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. The Greek word there is sabbatismos. It's another seventh day. And that's the seventh day at the end of the week of redemption. So from the time that Adam fell into sin, God had to start working again, but this time not in creation but in redemption. Now the reason I'm showing this is just to give an overall picture uh, and to have, have a look and see this is that week of redemption. In that week of redemption, those six days reveal God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit to the whole of humanity. God was introducing himself step by step and we got to know about the Father in the first 2,000 years. Uh, the Holy Spirit was there, the Son was there too, but the emphasis was on the Father and that first 2,000 years, which goes from Adam to Abraham and we see that was the age of the fathers. Adam, the father of uh, all humanity. Noah, the father of all living. Coming down to Abraham, um, the father, oh, the father. Uh, well, I guess he was that too. The father of all who believe. The next 2,000 years takes us through the two only begotten sons in the whole of the Bible. There's only two only begotten sons. The first one is Isaac, who is a picture of Christ being taken up the mountain to be sacrificed uh, and coming down to Jesus, the only begotten son uh, of God the Father. Now, for Isaac, there was a redemptive lamb a lamb that became the substitute sacrifice. So instead of Isaac dying, the lamb died in his place. Well, when Jesus came, there was no lamb to die in his place because he was the lamb uh, and he fulfilled that. Then you get the next 2,000 years. Now that's the cross around about the year 30 AD. Uh, there were 120 disciples uh, on that day who were filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, and that was the Pentecost Holy Spirit outpouring in Jerusalem. And it brings us down 2,000 years later, getting close to it now, will bring us down to the 120th Jubilee. Now, a Jubilee year, you know how long a Jubilee year is? 50 years, yeah. So in 2,000 years, you've got 40 Jubilees. Another 40, and then another 40. There's 120. There's a whole Bible study on the number 40 and on the number 120. I mean, digging into the Word of God is such a rich experience. So 40, 40, 40, 120. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit globally at the 120th Jubilee, the fulfilment of God's uh, plan and, uh, um, and purpose, bringing us down to that seventh day Sabbath of rest, which is called the millennium, the 1,000 year rule and reign of Christ. Now, we're not going to be studying this. This is just to give you the, uh, the, the timetable. Yeah, Say, where's that? Um, 
Uh, oh, sorry. That should be uh, um, G E N for Genesis. I, my, my fingers accidentally typed in Indonesian. Okay, so that's Genesis 6, verse 3, where, where God said, My spirit will not always strive with the flesh, but, but his days are numbered 120 years. Hmm? Yeah, it's a very loving book, right? Oh, yeah, that's it. Uh, kiss is acts. These, these, these things happen. I went over it again and again and again to make sure it wasn't there, but it is. Thank you for the question. Now, this is now coming down to the, from the time of the cross down to the time of the end. So this is the last 2,000 years, the age of the Holy Spirit. And we're in roughly the year 2024 and roughly 2030... Based on the 2,000 years, 2,000 years, 2,000 years, you know, because that second 2,000 years came down to the year 30 AD, the year that Jesus was crucified. Some say it was 29. Some say it was 33. So we know that some of those dates are guesstimates. They're not necessarily 100% accurate. So... When I say 2030, that's why I've got the plus or minus on, on all of these, because it's, it's approximate. And in fact, if you were to ask me, how much time do we have left? Uh, I'd say, well, between six and 30 years. Um, we don't know the day or the hour. That's one of the things that the scripture uh, tells us. But this period of time between now and the second coming of Christ, whatever that date is, that period of time is the most important period in history. It's called the end times. This is when there's going to be the culmination of everything that God has been working for ever since Genesis 1 verse 1. This is the grand climax. And we happen to be the generation that are privileged to be alive for this day and age. Now, for some of us, we would much prefer it to be the six years. The younger generation would prefer it to be the 30 years or more if possible. Uh, but when Jesus came the first time, it tells us he came right on time. He came in the fulfilment of time. God sent forth his son into the world. And when it gets to the end, the same thing will happen. It's as it was in the days of Noah. Noah was told to build an ark. We're told to build the church, the body of Christ, to preach the gospel, uh, to build his house that can be filled with his glory. But when Noah went into the ark, he didn't know how long before the rain would start coming down. God told him to go in, so he went in, and God shut the door. Now, I wonder what was going on inside and outside of the ark at that time. Uh, Maybe Noah and his family were saying, well, what's going to happen now? It, it, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, we thought it was going to happen straight away after we came in, but it hasn't happened yet. And the people outside knocking on the door, Noah, you're still there? Hello? And they're mocking him. But when the appointed time came, earthquakes, tectonic plate movements, the waters from beneath came gushing up. The heavens opened up and came pouring down. And the, the final judgment of that era happened. And only those who were in the ark were saved. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. That's what Jesus said. We might not know the day or the hour, but we do know the end result. So that's just giving you the time frame. And if that scares you a little bit, well, good. We probably need a bit of a uh, you know, needle in the backside or something to, to get us stirred up and to know that we cannot waste time in just sitting around waiting for the heavenly aeroplane to come and pick us up and take us to glory. Uh, I want to make sure that you're on that plane when it comes. But I don't want you to spend your time in the waiting room. I want you to fulfill the plan and purpose of God. 
Now, onto the subject of perfection. The vision of the early church was to see the restoration of the fullness of God's glory and the bringing of his people to perfection in the body of Christ. And we find that there are two great mysteries. The first one is called the mystery of iniquity. Some translations say the mystery of godliness. Ah, sorry, ungodliness, lawlessness. That's 2 Thessalonians 2.7. And then you have the mystery of godliness, 1 Timothy 3.16, which you can link up with Ephesians 5.32, where it's called a great mystery. And this is where the perfection of Christ is manifest uh, both in himself as well as in his people. This is a rather frightening scripture, this one. Revelation 11, 1 to 2. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshippers. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because... It has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Now, can I borrow your walking stick? The measuring stick. This is Christ. The measuring rod is Christ. And it will be applied to every person who is in the holy place. Do they measure up? to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ, as it says in Ephesians chapter 4. Christ is the measuring stick, not you against me or against somebody else. There is only one measuring rod, and that's Christ. Mm. And we are to come to the fullness of the measure of Christ. That's why the fivefold ministries were given, to bring everybody to the fullness uh, of the knowledge of Christ and to the fullness of the measure of the stature um, of Christ. I have one of those too, but I didn't bring it. it. Actually, I picked it up in Sinai, and it's made of wood, and it's got, a, it's got a snake carved into it around it. But here we find that this reed, like a rod, and said, go and measure the temple of God. Well, who's the temple of God? You and me. We are the temple of God. Do you not know that you are the temple of God? And the Spirit of God dwells in you. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us the same thing, that of Jews and Gentiles, he has built them together as one holy temple in the Lord. And Christ is the chief cornerstone. So that's actually the third temple. Forget about a third temple being built in Jerusalem. The third temple is you. We are the third temple. Jesus said, I will destroy this temple and I'll build it again in three days. And he was talking about his body. Anyway, so the church and the pictures of the church, of God's house, were given throughout the Old Testament. Now, first of all, we see in the tabernacle of Moses, then we see it in David's tabernacle, then we see it in uh, Solomon's temple, and then we have a a vision of it in Ezekiel's uh, temple. Measure the temple. And the altar, the altar, that's the altar of incense, the place of worship, with its worshippers. But those who are in the outer court, now it's in three parts, most holy place, holy place, outer court. Those in the outer court are not going to get measured because they don't fit the measure. They don't come to it. And in fact, they're going to be trodden underfoot and uh, destroyed in the age of the Antichrist. Now, the church has three parts in the scriptures. One part is that one-third who will become apostate, one-third of the church worldwide. Uh, Once upon a time, that was hard to believe. But I can remember when I became a Christian uh, back in 1965, countries like America and Australia and uh, 
South Africa and Canada, uh, European countries, uh, they were Christian countries. These countries have abandoned the faith. Bit of a problem for those who believe in the teaching of once saved, always saved, because what happens to all of those ones who have become apostate who now totally reject Christ? Well, we, were, we are told in the scriptures that one third will become apostate and that means to totally turn back and reject Christ. These are ones who had known the truth but had turned away. The second group uh, is one third who will die by the hand of Antichrist. These are ones who will have their heads cut off in the time of the great tribulation uh, that's spoken of in Revelation 13 and also referred to in Revelation 20, verses 4 and 5. And then the third group will be perfected and never die. These are the ones that the Bible tells us will be alive and remain to the coming of the Lord. Now, if I was to take a survey here, how many would like to be in group one? How many would like to be in group two? How many would like to be in group three? I think we all would want to be in group three. But we see, we need to have a vision for that. If we say, oh, no, 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 that's, that's, that's impossible, what did Jesus say? Be it done unto you according to what you believe. So if you don't believe for it, you create a problem for yourself. Let's read Zechariah 13, 8 to 9 and also over in Revelation 12. <clears throat> Zechariah 13, 8 to 9. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish. So group number one, who become apostate, and group number two, who are going to be persecuted and killed by the Antichrist, those two-thirds will die. They will perish. Yet the one third will be left in it. This third I will put into the fire. I will refine them like silver uh, and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. So this is the overcoming group of people. So one third will become apostate. In Revelation 12, 3 to 4, it says another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail, T-A-I-L, you know, swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Now, throughout the scriptures, the seed of Abraham was divided into the spiritual and the physical. The physical was covered by the soil, the grains of soil, and the grains of sand. That was the natural descendants um, of Abraham. But the spiritual descendants of Abraham said, your seed will be as numberless as the stars of heaven. And here we find that in the last days, Satan, this great red dragon, with his tail, his T-A-I-L, swept one-third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. This is that one-third, who are, that apostasy. Uh, these are the ones who uh, turn away and do not accept the protection um, of God and they will be judged and destroyed. Now, the tail. What's the tail? Well, Isaiah 9, 15 to 16, the Bible interprets the Bible. Isaiah 9, 15 to 16, prophets who teach lies are the tail. So what is the T-A-I-L? And Jesus said in the last days, there are going to be many false prophets and they're going to be teaching all manner of lies to deceive those who guide this people mislead them and those who are guided are led astray. <coughs> In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3 uh, and also verses 9 to 11, Paul says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day, the day of the coming of the Lord, will not come until the rebellion 
uh, other translations say the falling away, the great falling away. The Greek is the same in both of those translations. It's the apostasia. They, are, they have gone into apostasy of total rejection of Christ. And he's talking to the church. Don't let anyone deceive you. See, there's a lie that's been uh, spread abroad that they were facing in, in their day and age. And it says, until the apostasy occurs and the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed, the man doomed to destruction, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance uh, with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. See, that's the tale. It's the lie. The tale, the T-A-I-L, in effect becomes a T-A-L-E. It's the tale, the lie. <clears throat> and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth. Now, this is another thing I would like to emphasize. I want to see everybody in GVCF loving the truth. You need to have an overwhelming passion and love for the truth. The truth and nothing but the truth. They perish because they refused to love the truth. And so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion. Isn't that frightening? Who will send this delusion? God will. Because of their hardness of heart because they refuse to love the truth, they reject the word of God. So God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. Don't soften, no, don't harden your heart. The truth is so important. It's the truth that will set you free. 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 2, Paul says, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times, the last days, our day and age, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits. These deceiving spirits are telling the tale. They're telling the lie. See, Satan wants to destroy. He doesn't come to bring life. He comes to bring death and destruction. They will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Jesus in Matthew 24, great chapter on the end times, in verses 10 and 11, he says, At that time, many will turn away from the faith. So Paul uh, is actually just reiterating what Jesus taught. There is going to be a great falling away. Many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. This is a constant message that we read in the teachings of Jesus. The prophet Daniel in Daniel 12 and verse 1 warns of this time that is coming at the end of the age. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning um, of time, has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, those who truly love Jesus, love his word, uh, commit themselves totally to him, at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book <coughs> will be delivered. Well, that's comforting. Well, after the one-third become apostate, there's only two parts left. And these two parts that are left are the lukewarm believers. We could call them the foolish. These are the ones who say, well, I want to go to heaven. But don't get too religious. Don't be too serious. The important thing is to make it. You know, even 
if you just sneak in by the back gate and, and, it's, and you're over in some corner as long as you get in. But that's not what Jesus wants. He wants you to be an overcomer, a victorious Christian, a Christian being changed and transformed into the image of Christ. The other group are the overcoming believers, those who have that on their heart. These are called the wise. So after that one third became uh, apostate, the other two parts now represent 50% uh, each of the church. Uh, half are wise and half are foolish. And what happens to them? Well, Jesus taught us in the parable of the ten virgins. Matthew, another one of these uh, typos. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's Matthew. 25, 1 to 10, at that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins. See, at that time. And they took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. See, the bridegroom's coming. Who's the bridegroom? Jesus. Yes. And they went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars uh, along with their lamps. The bridegroom uh, was a long time in coming. Wow, it's been nearly 2,000 years. And they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Are you amongst the ones that are drowsy and falling asleep? Oh, yeah, we've heard that Jesus is coming back. <gasps> Well, they fell asleep, including the wise. Well, the difference is the wise ones took oil in jars along with their lamps. And the bridegroom was long time in coming and they all became drowsy, fell asleep at midnight... That's a whole Bible study throughout the whole of the Bible. You, you get your concordances and study the word midnight from the start to finish and you'll find amazing things happen at midnight. And the cry rang out, <clears throat> Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Well, would you be ready? Could you measure up to the, to the measuring rod? Have you allowed the processes of the Holy Spirit and God's word working within you? so that you might be changed and transformed into his image? Well, then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, oh, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. You see, they've gone into the outer court. Remember we heard about those ones? Don't measure the outer court. See, those ones don't measure up to the measuring rod. The virgins went off to buy oil, but the bridegroom arrived. It's time for the wedding. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Now, remember when we had the measuring stick measuring what part of God's house was being measured? It was the holy place where the altar of incense, where the worshippers were. Those who are not up to the measure of Christ and the sun began to shine. I see the light. Anyway, they, they had to go to the outer court. So what happens in the outer court? Well... Those who were in the holy place 
have gone in to the most holy place. They've gone in with the bridegroom. This is talking about the fulfillment of God's plan where his church will be transformed into his image as his glorious bride. But those who were in the holy place but had run out of oil, they've had to go out into the outer court. Remember in Revelation 11, 1 to 2, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and its worshippers, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. They are going to go through that 42 months or three and a half years of the reign of the Antichrist, that reign of terror. They could have missed on that, but they were not really prepared to take up the cross and follow Christ fully. They didn't just want to live the gospel and proclaim the gospel message. They wanted to sit back and enjoy the fruit of the gospel. Now, I trust that we all enjoy the fruit of the gospel, but we are to proclaim the gospel. The Victorian government will not win Shepparton for Christ. These are the people who will win Shepparton for Christ. Revelation 11.3, and I will appoint my two witnesses. Now, this is Moses and Elijah, and that's a separate study again. And they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. This period of time, the coming uh, one-third, so the overcoming one-third, they will go into the wilderness and they will be under divine protection. They'll still be attacked, but Satan won't be able to touch them. He will come after them with a flood, but the earth will swallow it up. In Psalm 23, it says, they will have a feast in the presence of the Lord. Satan won't be able to touch them. We're not going to be floating around in clouds. We're going to be right here on the earth. We're going to be eyewitnesses of the judgment of God that's going to be poured out. But sadly, the one-third who went out into the outer court, they're going to perish, as it said in Zechariah 13, that two-thirds are going to die, and they will die, but they will die the martyr's death. And because they hold fast to their faith to the end, they will be part of the first resurrection and they will get the, the same uh, reward of living and ruling and reigning with Christ for 1,000 years. But I would rather give my head to Jesus now and let him be my head than for the Antichrist to take it off. In Revelation 12, we see that there's a glorious bride of Christ Revelation 12, 1, a great sign appeared in heaven. Now, Revelation 12, you've got to put it in context. Revelation 11, Revelation 12, and Revelation 13 is one period of time called three and a half years. It's the time when the Antichrist will rule and reign for three and a half years. It's the time when Christ's two witnesses are going to be pouring judgment out upon the face um, of the earth. And it's the time when God's overcomers, who have finished the task of global evangelism, are going to be having a feast. It's our wedding feast. Now, we've already had the wedding. Of course, the wedding is going to be in stages because uh, when we have the first resurrection, we've got all the saints from all ages and they're going to join us and then we're going to have another wedding feast. We're going to have lots of wedding feasts. I mean, the wedding feasts in the Bible are metaphorical of God gathering together with his people to have a glorious time. Let's have a look at the, 
the glory of the first resurrection because when Jesus returns at the end of that period of three and a half years of the reign of the Antichrist, there is going to be the first resurrection. And all, un, uh, all believers of all ages who died will be raised from the dead. You see, there is no believer who will not see the second coming of Christ. Isn't that good? Especially for us oldies. We're going to be there. We might have to get raised from the dead to be there, but that's what his promise is going to do. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 41 to 42, the Son, that's the glory of God the Father, has one kind of splendor. The moon, that's the glory of the Son. The moon that reflects the light from the Son, just as Jesus reflects the light from the Father. The moon turned into blood is the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. And the stars. And the stars, well, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Who who led the wise men to Jesus at his birth? It was the stars. That's the work of the Holy Spirit to lead us to Christ. And it says, so will it be in the resurrection of the dead. There's going to be differences in glory in the resurrection uh, and... uh, That's something that it's good for us to study again in the future. Glory of the Father, the Son, Matthew 13, 43. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The Son in the Scriptures talks about the glory of God, represents the glory of the Father. Psalm 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. And we know that Jesus reflects the Father's glory. Everything that the He says, I only speak what the Father tells me to speak. I only do what the Father tells me to do. And in Matthew 17, 2, when the Father came and revealed his glory upon Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun. And his clothes became as white as as the light. A voice from the cloud said, this is my son. So here's the father speaking, declaring uh, Jesus. This is my son whom I love. With him am I well pleased. Listen to him. Malachi 4.2, for you who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its race. And John 14.9, anyone who has seen me, has seen the Father. Jesus came to reflect the Father's glory. The sign of Jesus' glory, the blood moon. Joel 2.31, Acts 2.20. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Matthew 24, 29-30. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. You see, the church that Jesus is preparing is going to be filled with the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The sun, moon, and stars Well, the overcoming church will shine. doesn't mean to say we turn a light on and all of a sudden little rays of light are coming out of us. But in Isaiah 60 verses 1 to, well, actually 1 to 3, Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears. Over you. It's going to be visible. People are going to see it. In what form? I'm not really sure. But it's going to be glorious. And the impact of it is nations will come to your light. It's going to be the impetus that you could say provokes the great end time revival. The church being changed and transformed into the image of Christ. You know, 
In Romans 8, 19, it says, I consider that our present suffering are not worthy compared uh, with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Creation is waiting for you to be revealed as the children of God. Jude 1, 14 to 15. Enoch the seventh from Adam. I just mentioned that because the number seven means perfection. And Enoch, God said to him, Enoch, keep walking. And he, and he went to glory without seeing death. He was the seventh from Adam. That's just a little bit on the, the, the genealogies. But know and understand, this is very important, that through the cross... Jesus has made atonement for our sins so that he could eliminate our sin totally. Now, I want you to grasp this. Our legal status, your legal status, you are 100% righteous, sinless, innocent, perfect. When you receive Christ, you were totally redeemed. Nevertheless, our living reality that we experience every day, okay, my legal status is I'm 100% righteous and perfect. But the living reality is that we still have sin and we need to grow and change daily so that our living reality will eventually become the same as our legal status. See, our living reality is here, our legal status is there. We're now on a journey, walking in Christ, walking in the truth, being changed and transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit until that day comes when our reality, our living reality, will be the same as our legal status. Our legal status declared in Hebrews 10, 14, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect. Now, that's in the past tense. He has made perfect. Not he will make perfect. He has made perfect forever. Those who are... Now, notice this is the, the reality process. Those who are being made holy. So, legally, we're perfect forever. But here on earth, we are going through a process of sanctification where we are being made holy until one day these two shall meet. This diagram may help to grasp that. In the work of the cross, we are justified. Therefore, our legal status is that we are perfect and sinless. But the reality is that we're imperfect. We're still sinners. But we are to grow daily to be in the image and likeness of Christ. Romans 5.1 Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, justified, like I've got it down the bottom there, just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. Through faith. Legally, we are not guilty. Legally, we are perfect. And that's why we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's our legal status, justified. But we are growing. This is what the process is. We're not just to sit around in the, uh, the waiting room of the, uh, the airport, the spiritual airport called the church, and just sit around and wait for the heavenly aeroplane to come. We are to grow maturing daily until we are in the likeness of Christ. This is the challenge that we are facing. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror that's the mirror of God's word beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into what? The same, the same image from glory to to glory, justice by the Spirit of the Lord. This is the work that he's going to do. This is what grace is, that he's going to work within us 
As we surrender ourselves to him, he works within us more and more. The more we receive of him, the more we believe in him, the more he works within us and we are progressively changed and transformed into the image of Christ. Colossians 1.28 is him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man in the church perfect in Christ Jesus. We don't want, it's like the American Marines say, nobody left behind. Don't believe in left behind theology. We want everybody to be changed and transformed. We want to see every person, every member of the church on fire for Christ, loving Christ, studying their scriptures, spending time in prayer and growing and transforming. And this will, this will actually make them much more effective evangelists. In the Bible, this is, you could say this is the apostolic commission. The great commission was to go out and make sure everybody hears the gospel. The apostolic commission was to make sure that every believer reaches their full potential of being changed and transformed into the image um, of Christ. Our goal is to be perfect like Jesus. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her for the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself when he comes to get his bride when he comes to get his church he wants to have a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and without blemish this is what Jesus wants. Well, I've got halfway through number one. <coughs> and our time is up. But before we close, is there a question? I see. Graham's got a question. So one person will die by the Antichrist. Is that right? One third of Christians will die by the Antichrist? Yes. Well, the one-third are ones who were Christians who totally deny Jesus. These are ones who take to themselves the spirit of Antichrist. And it says they will be <coughs> thrown into a judgment where there is gnashing of teeth and weeping forever and ever. It's the most abysmal end. To think that they had known Christ and then turned away. That's a shocking thing. But one third of Christians who, in the present period of time, and, and we know that there's, uh, in every church, there's, do, do they love Jesus? Yeah, they love Jesus to a certain extent, to a certain level of commitment. They believe it's true but they're not willing to take up the cross to follow Christ. Not willing to face the embarrassment of being uh, told you're a religious nut. So they would rather keep quiet. They don't want to share their faith. They want to be accepted by people. They want to be nice to people. They want to be good people. But they don't want to face the sufferings and the rejection and the humiliation of being a Christian. But Jesus said, if you reject me, I will reject you before my Father in heaven. So the challenge to all Christians is that we're not going to be like that. We're going to be bold in our faith. If we get persecuted for our faith, well, Jesus said that was going to happen. All who live godly in Christ Jesus, Paul said, shall suffer persecution. Now that wasn't a threat. That was a promise. <coughs> Following Christ will bring persecution. And in the book of Revelation, we find there is a 10-day period
period. Now, that 10 days could be years and years and years, but it's 10 days in the book of Revelation, where the righteous are going to suffer persecution because Satan wants to stop us from reaching perfection. He's going to do whatever he can to stop us from getting there. But then after that is going to be this time when the Antichrist will unleash persecution. It's called the Great Tribulation, a time of tribulation such as never was before and never will be again. In that period of time, those Christians who were, yeah, go to church once a month, uh, love Jesus, uh, yeah, but with limitations, uh, they're going to find themselves in a shocking situation because when that time comes, they will have missed the opportunity to be the overcomers who are going to be under the wings of the Almighty who is going to provide them with that supernatural protection during that time of horror. A bit like the children of Israel in the land of Goshen. Judgment was being poured out um, throughout Egypt, but God's people were under his divine protection. So uh, my goal in Christian ministry is one, to try and make sure everybody who's within my accountability does not become part of that first third and abandon the faith. Secondly, that those who are a little bit half-hearted, that they get stirred up enough to be on fire for Christ and want to walk in Christ. And then, of course, thirdly, to be a part of the overcoming uh, company, realising that unless it's his grace uh, and his spirit that works within me, uh, well, any of us uh, could stumble. Just another point of time, a quick answer to this one is what I was praying and what you're saying would be during that time where the Christians are protected, through the whole, wholehearted Christians are protected, and this middle group that he's asking the question about um, will They could. Deny Christ they could. And, and shave my head. Mm -hmm. So they then go back to the apostate church. Is that, is yep. that possible? That, that could happen. Yeah. And in fact, I think the Antichrist is going to be mm. play dirty. Yeah. Uh, he might get a family <clears throat> and say, uh, let's say to the husband, look, if you deny Christ and receive the 666, I'll spare your family. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, starting off with your youngest child and they've got the guillotine there ready to lop off their head and the child is calling out, Daddy, Daddy, don't let them do this to me, Daddy. Yeah. That's what I think he's going to do. He's going to be dirty and he's going to do everything he can to get people to deny Christ. What? Can you defend yourself? Are you yeah. sure? they're, they're, they're difficult times, Graham. They're difficult times. Now, there are more, more questions, but our time is up. Uh, uh, I'm not against more time, uh, but I've got to stay within the rules. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we'll close in prayer, and if somebody's got some questions, come and talk to me as uh, we, we close up and, and leave. Okay? Father, thank you for this time together. We pray that your Holy Spirit would stir us up to study your word, knowing that the only one who has all the answers is you. 
And Lord, we want to understand your answers. And that's why you've given us your word. Help us, Lord, as we study. And let your Holy Spirit lead us and guide us so that we might, as you said in your, your word, be led and guided into all truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, good night. And uh, in a fortnight's time, we will continue. And uh, I hope in the meantime that we find a way on a, uh, some sort of a... Uh, it can be uploaded onto something where people can just... You get the uh, inf information of where you can download the PowerPoint. Well, we have